the path of the just is like a shining light, shining brighter, bright as the noonday. Hello and welcome to Walking in the Word. We're going to continue our journey with Paul through his life and see how that God saved he and many others through a miraculous deliverance. So, Alton, please start for us. Please start for us. Yes. Well, we're at the point where Paul gets brought before King Agrippa. Okay, now, if you don't understand the government at the time, he had Rome, Caesar was over the empire. He had governors like Pilate over certain areas. And there were still Jewish kings that were allowed to govern certain areas. And so Agrippa had one of these areas. He was under uh, Felix and then Festus. And so Paul comes before him and he gives him a rendition of what he went through on the road to Damascus and how the Lord had pretty much got a hold of him and opened his eyes to what he wanted him to do. And so that's what brought him to where he was. And so he says in verse 19 of chapter 26, uh, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Okay? He wasn't, he didn't disobey it. You know, Paul was, had to be, um, in a, in a place where he was trying his best to do the law and be obedient to the Mosaic law to the nth degree, but he wasn't picking up on the spirit of the law. The law was a teacher. It, it just brought you and helped guide you into a righteous area, but it didn't change your character. It didn't change your personality. It didn't do anything like that. And so... Here he is doing the law, but killing people, you know, because something to people being killed that he thought was not obeying the law. See, but I wasn't uh, a disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For these causes, the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying one other thing, uh, none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. So, you know, you can call yourself a Christian, you can call yourself an Israelite, but if you're not picking up on what God's doing, what are you doing? Okay, so Paul's just taking the Old Testament, bringing it up to date. This Now, this is where God's going with all this. Everything in the Old Testament is like a, like a magnifying glass. It pinpoints to Jesus coming. So if you're an Israelite and you want to continue being an Israelite, you must move along with what God is doing. And so we think there's a Gentile and a Christian thing. It says in Ephesians that he broke down that middle wall of partition and out of two, he made one new man, okay? All this uproar all the time about Israel and Christian, Judeo-Christian. It's Christian now, okay? If an Israelite wants to stay up to date with God, they have to come into that. Now, you might take offense to that, but I'm sorry. I'm just telling you what you're up against. And so, um, as I continue witnessing these things, that Christ should cut, suffer, and that he should be the first that should be that should rise from the dead, and sh 
should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning hath made thee mad. Well, you know, if you ever talk to somebody at length about almost anything, they think you're crazy. It doesn't even have to be about godly things. It could be about anything, politics or something. And you know so much that you're you're off the deep end. And, and the things of God to men are crazy. Why? Because it's God built us, created us to be this, and we're trying to be this. And so everything that God does is 180 degrees to what man wants. That's why they said those people that have turned the world upside down are come here. Well, what's that mean? 180 degrees. You want to you repent? You want to turn over a new leaf? 180 degrees. So when you hear something like what Paul's putting forth to him, it's 180 deg 80 degrees out, and you sound like you're nuts to, to people. And, uh, but he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth that of these things, before whom I also speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. Nothing God does has to be hidden, secret, or anything. Okay? Sometimes they're secret to us because we don't understand them. He was transfigured on the highest point in all of Israel, yet only three guys saw it. And so he doesn't have to do anything in the corner. He's unstoppable. He doesn't have to sneak around, okay? It was not done in a corner. And so he says, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest and Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that, that not only you, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these bonds. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, and they that sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed to Caesar. And, you know, all of this, all this that Paul went through was for one thing. To, to witness to whoever the Lord wanted him to witness to next. Okay? He gets put in, a, in the Philippian jail. He gets whipped and everything, and, and, and he gets put in the jail, and then he and Silas are singing at midnight, and, and the jail busts open. Paul could have ran out. But that wasn't get, what God's purpose was for him. It was to help save this Philippian jailer and his family and all his friends that he could. Everything Paul did, we might say, oh man, I got stuck in jail, oh man, I got this. Everything that Paul ever went through was to further the gospel, and he was ready to do that. And so, um, you know, all along the way, he got favor with the Roman guards. He got favor with Felix, okay? Uh, he could have been put in a slimy prison like a lot of people were, but at this point, he, they were putting him in jail by putting him in a palace. <laughs> and uh, how often do you get to, you know, we're, we're going to give you 30 days in jail and we're going to put you in the Ritz Hotel. And so... God gave him favor, he w and he wasn't eating jail food. He was eating whatever the king ate. 
but every opportunity, you know, it was funny because because uh, when Felix first got him, he was hoping Paul would give him some money to let him go. So every day he'd put him back in the in the clink, but he'd bring him forth every day to see if he'd bring him give him money. And that went on for a while. And instead of him getting money from Paul, he was getting the gospel. Every day Paul got brought, was brought before him, and he got more of the word. And, and so here this guy was trying to get money, but he was getting something worth a whole lot more than money. But Paul was ready. He, he saw the opportunity, and every day he gave him some more. And everything Paul did was to further the gospel, and we'll see in a little while. Um, even get, getting shipwrecked furthered the gospel. And so, um, in, in, uh, when Paul talked to the Romans, in verse uh, 1, or chapter 1 of Romans, verse 15, so as much as in me is, okay, you can only give out what you have in you. What God has made real to you by experience, by you going through certain things. As much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. The righteous shall live by faith, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. So in this scenario, God always still remembered his people. He gave them first crack at everything. And if he re refused it, he moved on to somebody that wanted to be an Israelite. You know, when he saw um, Nathaniel, he said, An Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Okay? In other words, his character was that of what should be being shown forth as an Israelite character. And just because Abraham's your daddy don't mean you picked up on who he was in his relationship with the Lord. And so we have to be careful. We can call ourselves by a name, but we have to then exhibit that. Okay, and and like I said, you know, Festus, he said, you're, you're crazy, man. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Okay, so when you go out and you, and you talk to people, you have to remember that um, spiritual things have to be spiritually discerned. And God gives all of us a measure to start with of his spirit even before we get baptized in the spirit because it's like sourdough bread. you got to have a starter <laughs> to get you going. And once you get going then you can be, be, it's like a seed. You, you can start to grow, and when you plant a seed, you know, I don't know if you ever think about this, but when you plant a garden, it tells you each seed how de deep to plant it. If you plant some things too deep, well, what it has to uh, make it to the surface wouldn't be enough. That seed has in it what it takes for that Thing to shoot out of the out of the earth and then it grows a leaf and then it can start photosynthesis and begin to grow and become whatever it was uh, meant to be and so God gives all of us a measure and that measure will get us started and we will break through the earth in the, in the the energy that we get, that it gets from the sun or the energy we get from God will cause us to grow and become uh, 
I don't want to say self-sufficient, but will become God-sufficient. And so at this time, I will turn it over to my lovely wife. Thank you, honey. <clears throat> so in Acts 27, let's pick up with chapter 27 and look at verse 1. We've seen how Paul was faithful to minister to King Agrippa and all that came to hurt to, that came and heard him. But verse 1 of 27, we see that Paul is finally beginning to walk toward his grand finale. And that being his time in Rome that God said he would accomplish. And verse 1 says, And when it was determined that we, Paul, Luke traveled with Paul, Luke, Paul, and later Aristarchus, sailed for Rome with the help of a friendly Roman centurion named Julius, who allowed Paul to go visit friends' houses at ports along the way. So once again, just like God had him imprisoned, the Lord had him imprisoned in a palace, basically. Now we see he's being put on a ship with Roman, a Roman centurion that God gives him favor with. And so Julius allows him to go visit friends at ports, and God really gave him favor with this, this centurion. If you drop down to verse 9, and let's just read for a while, it says, and much time having been used up in the voyage already being dangerous because of the fast that was now already past. So it was the time of year, getting in the time of year that it was getting towards the end of the year and, and sailing could be dangerous. Paul warned them. He warned the shipmaster and the centurion saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage is about to be with much harm and loss, not only much cargo and of the ship, but also of our souls. Verse 11, But the centurion was rather persuaded by the helmsman and the shipmaster, of course they had a schedule to keep, than by the things spoken by Paul. So you can appreciate this situation. Paul's a prisoner on his way to Rome, and he's giving advice to a shipmaster. But yet it was the word of the Lord. We know that. Verse 12, and the port not being fit to winter in where they were at, most of them advised to set sail from there if by any means they might be able to get to Phoenix, the port of Phoenix, to winter, which is a port of Crete, looking toward the southwest and the northwest. So it was, it was on the right side of the island and everything would be good if they could get there. Verse 13, and a south wind blowing softly, Thinking that they had obtained their purpose, they lifted sail, anchor, and set sail close beside Crete. Verse 14, but not long after, a stormy wind called Eurachlodon beat down on them, and the ship being seized by the wind and not being able to beat against the wind, giving way, we were borne along. So they were just basically having to drift with the wind storm that was prevailing. Verse 19, and on the third day they threw out the tackle, the ship's equipment, with their hands. And so they're getting to a point of desperation now after three, three days of this wind and this storm. Verse 12, verse 20, then with neither sun nor stars appearing in many days and with no small tempest pressing hard, now all hope that we would be saved was taken away. And there being much fasting, then standing up in the midst, Paul said, O oh men, being obedient to me, you ought not to have set sail from Crete and to have come by this harm and loss. Verse 22, Now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there will be no casting away of life among you, only of the ship. Now this, by this time, should be extremely good news that all lives are going to be saved, just the ship is going to be lost. For tonight, he said, an angel of God stood beside me, whose I am and whom I serve. And we're, I'm sure it was Gabriel that came to him. Therefore, men, be of good cheer. For the Lord said, 
You must stand before Caesar. Behold, God has given you all those who sail with you. And I believe God that it will be so according to the way that it was told me by the angel of the Lord. But we must run the ship aground on a certain island. So God, again, through his ministry angel, is giving Paul the word of knowledge on how to handle this situation and that all lives would be saved. Probably never before had a prisoner offered sailing advice, I'm going to guess. But we see a man of God here who is connected to God, who knows he has a mission to fulfill in Rome. And so, of course, his best interest is to see that they get there. So he was a man with a mission. And in verse 24, let's pick up. He said, um, again, in verse 24, I'm sorry, of the last chapter, he said, you must stand before Caesar. So God had told Paul, you're going to stand before Caesar. That is the plan. That's where you're going. Now, some insight on the Caesar of the day. This was Nero, who was notoriously a crazy man. In fact, he played, according to tradition, he played his violin while Rome burned around him. So he was a man that was not known for being rational or logical. But this is the man that God said, you're going to stand before Caesar and you're going to testify of me. So um, in chapter 23, verse 11, we're told that the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer. Uh, he told Paul, for you have testified of me in Jerusalem. This is just, again, some backstory. So you also must bear witness of me in Rome. So we could gather from the situation that they find themselves in. They're in a storm. Their ship's being beat to pieces. The men aren't eating and probably not drinking anything for days. And God says, be of good cheer. I'm going to pull you through this. So we could say, I guess, that the safest place to be with a man of God is if he has the plan of God and he's communicating that. So the safest place they could have been was on this ship with Paul in this storm as long as he's getting direction and revelation from the Lord on what to do. So Paul's godly heart had heard from the Lord. Verse 31 of chapter 27, Paul said to the centurion and soldiers, unless these people remain on this ship, you cannot be saved. So again, a word of knowledge, a revelation of what has to be done to fulfill this promise that all lives would be saved. Then the soldiers cut the ropes of the lifeboat, which some meant to use, and they let her fall. And while they waited for dawn to come, Paul begged all to take food, saying this, This is the 14th day since you have continued waiting without food. So they're, they're on this ship for two weeks in this storm. No one's eating, no one's drinking. They're all probably terrified. Having taken nothing for 14 days, therefore I beg you to take some food, for this is going to be your deliverance. For not a hair on your head shall perish. And taking bread, he gave thanks to God before all, and breaking it, he began to eat. And all 276, being encouraged, they also took food, verse 38, and being filled with food, they then lightened the ship, throwing the wheat out into the sea. And they ran aground, and the soldiers wanted to kill all the prisoners. But the centurion, remember our friend Julius, the Roman centurion, who God had given Paul favor with. But the centurion, desiring to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those that could swim should throw themselves overboard and to go out towards the land. And in so doing, all swam ashore and all were saved. So what an incredible thing that, again, we find the story here. A prisoner going to be delivered to Rome, but he's a man of God. He's a man of God with a plan of God. God tells him what needs to be done, what doesn't need to be done. Don't let them get in the lifeboat and strike out on their own because they won't survive. 
Everyone had to stay on the ship and then they were allowed to swim to shore. And because of that, all were saved. 276 souls made it to land and everyone was saved. So God is good to Paul in every way and he opens the doors for him, he opens opportunities, and he makes a way for not only him to survive, but all that are with him on the ship because there is a plan, there's a destiny for him to go to Rome and to speak before Caesar. So we see again the goodness of God, the faithfulness of Paul to make the best out of a bad situation and bring the word of the Lord concerning the matter. So we trust that this has been a blessing to you today and given you some food for thought as you study the life of Paul. May you be blessed. We now send our love to you in Jesus' name. We are the witnesses He has chosen For we know Say to the wind